every day is relative to the day before, isn't it? Your experience today is based on how you were feeling yesterday or what you were able to do yesterday. Within ME, we talk, don't we, about good days, bad days. And so if you were having a, a really good day yesterday and you were able to do X, X and X, you might be having a bad day today because post-exertional malaise plays a part. That can impact on your, your mental health if you're not used to it. It all impacts on your mental health just as much or if not greater than it does your physical health. Welcome to the Silent Elephant Project podcast, where we have conversations with everyday people living with life-limiting health conditions. We're not claiming to be specialists, but we are offering a therapeutic space to build dialogue around marginalised health themes, giving you the opportunity to listen in. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Getting to Know ME series, where we hear from both specialists and those living with the life-limiting condition ME short for myalgic encephalomyelitis. I'm Kondwani and I'll be your host. I have been living with ME-CFS myself and also fibromyalgia, might I add, for years now. I find inspiration in shared stories and today's episode is yet another addition to learning more from others on the journey of living with the health condition. In today's conversation, I will be talking to Russell Fleming all about his life living with ME. We touch on the research that has been done around ME CFS, his job at the ME Association, and what has helped him cope living with this health condition over the years. Hope you enjoy this episode. Well, I'm Russell Fleming, and I'm the head of communications at the ME Association. We're a charity that's been in existence since 1980. We boast the most recognised MECFS expert in Dr. Charles Shepherd. We provide support, information, we campaign, and we invest in research relating to myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. At the start of the pandemic, we were very quick to recognise the similarities between MECFS and the emerging long COVID. Both conditions, if in fact they are dissimilar conditions, are triggered by, in most people, an infection, most commonly a viral infection, from which people just can't recover. I would say that it's estimated that between five and 10% of people who contract an infection do not recover within six months and may well meet the diagnostic criteria for MECFS. So it's quite a significant problem, particularly with long COVID, which affects millions of people worldwide. One of the flagship services of the charity is ME Connect. We provide a telephone helpline for anybody affected by these uh, medical conditions. It's available 365 days a year and people can contact us obviously via email or social media private message. We deal with everything in the strictest of confidence and we try and help people at the personal level where we possibly can. The other difference I suppose about our charity and other charities is that we do directly fund research Some interesting studies recently with Dr. Nicola Clay Baker, who is a founding member of a group called Physios for ME. She has conducted a study that monitors the activities of people with ME in their own home because there's no research that demonstrate just how incapacitating ME is at home. And they want to try and work out what are the best methods of monitoring disability in this particular group. She's also running a second study which is using heart rate monitors 
again on people with ME, but also on people with long COVID, to see whether heart rate monitors can effectively be used while people try and pace their activities at home as a means of managing energy levels. In terms of the heart monitors and all those tools that are being, you know, researched further to find out the effects and how people cope with ME, give a brief overview of what ME really is and how deliberating it can be. So at the end of 2021, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, finally published a new clinical guideline on ME-CFS. It had taken four years of hard work and it is a guideline that we support. It provides a framework of recommendations to the NHS and to social care services. It helps GPs make a suspected diagnosis. It also recommends that specialist services are created or improved around the country so that people who have a suspected diagnosis can be referred for the diagnosis to be confirmed and then for help learning to cope and in managing the condition. The NICE guideline says that four main symptoms must be present for a diagnosis to be made. The first is debilitating fatigue that is worsened by activity. The second is something called post-exertional malaise which occurs after activity and worsens symptoms, which can be delayed in onset. It's a disproportionate reaction to the activity and it has a prolonged recovery time. The third symptom is unrefreshing sleep or sleep disturbance or both. This can include feeling absolutely exhausted, flu-like, which for me was probably one of the big symptoms or it was certainly how I would describe how I felt when I first went down with it. People often have broken or shallow sleep so you and I both have sleep problems in common don't we? This morning I'm just like I can't wait just to sleep but even though I know I'm gonna sleep and not, it won't do me much but it's just the fact that my functioning levels right now is just dragging my skeleton with me. <laughs> so you can feel exhausted which we all do and then you can try and sleep and you can't sleep and you'll suffer with insomnia. In my early sort of six years, I slept far more than I ever would have done normally. You know, there's a difference, isn't there, between sleeping too much, sleeping too little, and anything in between. Things like night sweats, night terrors. There's so many different things that can happen while trying to sleep or contribute to you feeling unrefreshed when you wake up. Absolutely. And given the fact that sleep is meant to be uh, the very most important thing that everybody must have and it's great for your body and your overall health, having to struggle with it or not getting the design output, which is you feeling restful. It's an interesting catch-22 living with Emmy myself. And even worse off, when you want to take a nap, you know you shouldn't, but to be honest, sometimes I just do it when I really struggle because it impacts the night and everything, you know, it means you off your sleeping pattern and your daily routine. You know, the maximum I can sleep at a time is about four hours if I'm lucky. If I can't remain asleep, I just get up and try and get on with either start work really early in the morning and then stop earlier. But I always have a, a sleep or a rest sort of just after lunch. I don't really let it bother me. I spent time in Spain and they always used to have siestas, so I don't see why we shouldn't. (laughs) But just very quickly, you know, you want to share your diagnosis journey so that people have a more insight into uh, what it's been like for you. Yeah, I will. So I'll just say the fourth symptom required for a diagnosis is cognitive problems, commonly referred to as brain fog. You can have trouble finding words or numbers, difficulty speaking. You can be quite slow in uh, responding to other people's questions, etc. And difficulty concentrating or multitasking. That can be an awful symptom to try and cope with, I I found, because it can leave you totally different to the person you were before. So those are the four main symptoms for a diagnosis. Debilitating fatigue, post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep and cognitive difficulties. 
but they aren't the only symptoms. They're just the ones that are necessary now for a diagnosis. So MECFS is regarded as a complex chronic medical condition which affects multiple body systems, although we're still unclear as to why it happens or what continues to perpetuate symptoms. We don't know why only certain people seem to be affected, why they can't recover like other people from a particular viral or bacterial infection or from other triggers. And we don't know why these people like you and I continue to suffer with these symptoms for years. Not everybody obviously suffers with the ME for years. Some people are fortunate they, they do recover within a relatively short time frame. People do suffer with it for decades. I myself have had it for 22 years. But obviously, I wrote my story you referred to, titled it Surviving ME. Had I written my story 10 years ago, it would have been completely different. But after 20, 20 years, I thought I could write a story titled Surviving ME because I was in a much better place than I was at any point prior to that. So a bit of my background then was in 1999, I was living and working in Jersey. I enjoyed a 14 year career with Lloyd's Private Banking. I was at that time an investment manager, but I held other positions as well. And I stood in for a friend who couldn't make a holiday abroad picked up an infection, was hospitalised, brought it back, was in hospital in Jersey, and basically I just couldn't recover. After about six months, the doctors diagnosed me with post-viral fatigue syndrome, and then 12 months ME. By that time, I was so badly affected that I couldn't take care of myself, so my parents came out to, the, to Jersey and, and brought me back to Cornwall. I just turned 30, I think, or 29, 30. Yeah, so I'm 54 now, or, or will be 54 in uh, next month. I, I won't say I'm typical of, of people with ME, of course, because we're all different. And I think that's one of the hard things for doctors and researchers to, to get to grips with, is that while we all do share similar symptoms, they affect us in different ways and at different times. It can be called a fluctuating condition, but I'm, I'm not sure even that's quite right because you can have long periods, uh, you know, stretching over years where nothing seems to improve, nothing seems to change. You can have other periods where your symptoms are fluctuating or your symptoms are getting worse and worse. So you're actually declining in health. Other periods where nothing seems to settle. You don't know where you are. You know, you can have periods where you get these false dawns, don't you? I mean, I had some, some notable ones of my own where you think, oh my God, I've had three good days in succession. I must go and do this. Off you go to, to do more or to, to do something daft. That one is very challenging, that's for sure, when you go through that phase. There's always this pressure on you, isn't there, when you're ill, to return to the life you had. And some of it is, it's genuine pressure, you know, it might be financial pressure. You haven't been able to work, so you're on sick pay if you're lucky enough to have that. Or you're on benefits and nobody wants to be on benefits. There's various pressures on you to get better. So at any opportunity, I think it's only natural you're going to leap. But you do learn over a period of time. That's not the wisest course with ME, but I completely understand it. Yeah, I've done it time and time again. Um, I remember one time it was summer and summer is one of the best times where I feel a bit better and then obviously winter is my worst. And I felt, oh, I think I can play football again. <laughs> now, this was, I think, five, six years ago, I believe. And I remember very well, literally playing. It was just simple five aside. I, had, I didn't even do much, just kicking the ball and my friends were running around. But boy, oh boy, did I regret it after. I was knocked out for two weeks, immobile for a couple of days or so. It was literally full regret. And from that moment at the time, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, she was just like, never again. Fast forward, I think three years ago or so. For <laughs> there, there I was again, feeling good. And it was tempting. But, you know, because of that moment, and obviously she reminded me, I thought, you know what? It's not worth it. How else are you going to know what your limitations are? 
you might not want to go to those extremes, of course, but one of the safest and arguably most effective ways of managing this condition and long COVID is something we refer to as pacing, you know, which is energy management effectively. So you try and organise activities that you can do within your available limit of energy. And then the idea being that most people are trying to do too much. So you, you, you scale down those activities into ones that you have to do, that you might want to do, that you would like to do. You know, you always try and have a balance of enjoyable activities as well as necessary activities. And this is obviously for people who aren't acutely affected, because if you're acutely affected, you're not really going to be able to do much in the way of activities. But if you had to make a telephone call or you had to write a letter or you had to do something like that, you might be able to, to do part of it on one day and then leave a day and return to, to doing it on the following day. You know, if you felt able to, to walk around the garden or walk around the house, if you're previously acutely affected you've been spending an awful lot of time in bed because your symptoms are so bad and you now find you can sort of get around the house a bit better you might include that as, as an activity but again you would pace it out so you wouldn't try and do everything all in one go you would break it into manageable chunks everybody's different i couldn't say to you right this is what you should be doing every day because your abilities are different to my abilities and your priorities are different to my priorities. It's quite a difficult illness to quantify the effect it has on people because in the past it attracted quite a stigma from the media and the medical profession based on ignorance. Today, with the new NICE guideline in particular, but also because of some of the research developments that have happened. I think there's a lot more understanding now of ME and with the onset of long COVID, long COVID's brought a real spotlight onto what were once called post-viral fatigue syndromes. So I think the situation we face today is a lot better than it was 10, 20 years ago, but we've still got a long way to go. And on your journey, when you're going through the diagnosis, how did you find it? Having worked for the ME Association, I've heard some appalling stories about people taking years to get the right diagnosis of misunderstanding. The waiting times were just so excessive that it just drags people down. And I think one of the things patients need to hear is that validation that you've got this condition and here's how you can manage it or here are the experts that can help you along your journey. But for me, my own journey, I think I was relatively lucky because in Jersey, ME was known. So when I saw my GP, he knew about it and he was able to diagnose first post-viral fatigue syndrome at around six months. And then as I said, ME at around 12 months. Yeah, so at that time, 20 years ago, that was pretty damn incredible. How about you? For me, it was an interesting journey in that at the time, that was 2010, 2011 period, yeah. I was in uni. I was at University of Leeds studying chemical engineering. I was on the master's uh, program. I felt really ill, so I was hit with a nasty, nasty, nasty bacterial virus. And unfortunately, I did not recover from that. Obviously, my studies had to stop because I couldn't cope. Everything literally came to, to a halt. When I was going through the GP, I started learning about all these other specialists I was being referred to. So that was a whole different process. So during all that time, it wasn't diagnosed yet that it's uh, ME CFS. So it took about six to 12 months before I finally got the official diagnosis. Right. And at that point, I was like, what does this mean, though? <laughs> I tried to check the information online. There was very little, confusing. But I think for me, what was really like a highlight in terms of my insight into what life would mean for me was when um, my doctor said, you know, some people do get better, but some people don't. And at the moment, we don't have the cure. My immediate thought was, well, I can hardly walk far. I'm pretty much housebound after being bedbound. Classic story, obviously. But then I'm meant to finish my studies. I've got all these other plans. What does it mean? I can't finish my studies. Fortunately, I was able to graduate with my bachelor's degree because I was okay in my third year. 
the whole reality and going through the whole process, having to move back to my parents in, in Sheffield and then having to rethink about life. Even thinking back now, having to go through, what, 12 months plus of the unknown, but knowing full that, you know, your life has already been limited and affected, it's definitely a traumatic event. It's how you push on forward from there, really. Because I just went with the assumption of, right, if it takes me a long time to get better, <laughs> I need to find a way of making sure I'm enjoying my everyday today, pretty much. Fast forward, you get to learn a lot more about things. I access information from Emmy Association, very useful resources, and then Action for Emmy as well. I discovered that. I was like, oh, interesting. Once I um, accepted that the journey of the diagnosis and living with this illness is on me first as a responsibility but with guided experts from those that know whatever information they know as of now i am still the expert in my own health in a sense i think acceptance is is one of the hardest it was the hardest thing for me i fought against it for years because of all the disabilities out there who the hell wants me at that time it was so stigmatized nobody knew anything about it there wasn't even, and there still isn't, a, a diagnostic test. I mean, if you go to a GP, you can't draw your blood, send it away for analysis, and then get a result back that says you've got ME. I mean, they arrive at a diagnosis still by excluding any other possible causes for your symptoms, don't they? Yes, yes, which takes time. Also, the lack of treatments. You get a diagnosis of this illness, 20 years ago or so I can't work and it starts messing with my head and I went through such mental health problems because I was just so demoralized and everything I tried just didn't improve things for me and I spent a fortune on all the treatments I could possibly you know anybody who said oh we can help you spend money on them couldn't help me at all just so I suppose that I could say, well, I'm trying my best. And every time it failed, it was a real knock to my mental health because there I was in Jersey in a flat that the bank paid for on sick leave. It went on month after month after month, having phone calls with my directors saying, putting a brave face on it saying, oh, you know, I should be back in the next week or something. And it just went on and on and on. But my job was so, so much part of me that losing it, I just couldn't accept. Not to an illness like ME. Even the medical profession doubted at that time. I struggled enormously with my mental health. And like you, actually, I think you mentioned something similar. It wasn't until I came back to Cornwall. It was after about, I think it was five years later, maybe, when things did start to settle and I could do a bit more. I met Professor Anthony Pinching down here. He was involved with ME research and he just told me in a no-nonsense tone exactly he felt ME was, that I had it, that I should stop being an idiot. This is how I should manage it. And I hadn't spoken to any other experts prior to that because there just weren't any. The only other source of help I think I had at the time was Dr. Charles Shepherd, who's our medical advisor at the charity. He had written a book I think at the end of the 80s, living with ME. And it was one of the first mainstream publications. Seeing Professor Pinching and being told in no uncertain terms that you know, I was approaching this illness completely wrong. You can accept it, stop beating yourself up, stop feeling guilty about it. That was probably a turning point for me. During your time, when you reflect back, what other support systems do you feel you had in place? One of the big problems I had in acceptance was guilt. There was guilt my work, obviously. There was guilt at the time I, I was engaged to be married. Well, no, the engagement happened after I got ME, actually, during a period when I was reasonably well, while I was still in Jersey. There was guilt about that because I had a relapse and I, it was such a bleak future. But I did have support from my fiance, obviously. Main support was from the family. I mean, mum and dad were coming out to Jersey to look after me, then having to come home, and then I had this big relapse. And having a very, very good family able to help has been key to 
my acceptance and progress. That's not to say that you learn to accept this illness and all of a sudden things start to change for the better. That's only part of it, isn't it? But it is a key part, I think. You know, once I stopped resisting it and fighting against it, it was easier mentally to cope with. But my mum and dad, I mean, they went through hell with me, for me. You know, even arguing with hospital staff who discharged me in their view too early or trying to get me mental health referrals. I mean, that was a nightmare. I attempted suicide at one point. Uh, I was taken into hospital by ambulance. Eventually, the on-call psychiatrist came in or I went in to see him. And his view was, because I explained I was struggling with ME and stuff, his view was that I wasn't trying hard enough. And I just screamed at him, I've been trying harder than anybody else. So that was the degree of medical input at that point in time. It was difficult trying to get in to see decent counsellors and things like that. Around 2013, NHS England gave about, I think it was just over £10 million to establish a network of MECFS specialist services within the NHS around England. The service opened up in Cornwall. And once I was in with them and had had the referral and things, it was good because things started to make sense. They had a clinical psychologist who knew about ME and it was a lot better then. And I think we started to make decent progress. Every day is relative to the day before, isn't it? Your experience today is based on how you were feeling yesterday or what you were able to do yesterday. Within ME, we talk, don't we, about good days, bad days. And so if you were having a, a really good day yesterday and you were able to do X, X and X, you might be having a bad day today because post-exertional malaise plays a part. That can impact on your, your mental health if you're not used to it. It all impacts on your mental health just as much or if not greater than it does your physical health. The feelings I experienced when I went through the diagnosis, hopelessness, feeling really lost and confused because from the get-go the information was little out there. But then the levels of anxieties as well, pretty much they, I'd never felt that amount for that specific experience dealing with the healthcare professions. What feelings did you experience when you were diagnosed? Anxiety, for example, in my normal life, you know, I might have got butterflies in my stomach if I was about to give a presentation to a conference. But the anxieties I felt with ME or from being unable to work, it affected me to such a, a physical extent. It was no longer just the, the butterflies that went away as soon as I walked up to the podium and started talking. It was, I don't know, they just would rack my body little things or little in relation to my life before and I would get so anxious about talking to somebody it was things like that feelings of again guilt and shame and you know real fear that is this my life now that was particularly the five years where I was you know largely or mostly bed bound the fear is this all it is now I can, I can share that feeling with you, definitely, I remember that, yeah. When you're able to get out of bed and you're able to do a bit more and you're active again to an extent within your home, the fear morphs into a different form of fear and you're like, am I ever going to be able to get back to work now? Or if I do go back to work, am I able to go back to the work that I had before? Or am I going to have to change my approach and am I only ever going to be able to work part-time? What effects that going to have on my income security, on the benefits that I might be getting? And fast forward to now, how, how are you finding the way you've managed to cope? Sort of eight years ago, maybe a bit longer, my symptoms finally started to sort of stabilise and then I noticed improvement and I can't put my finger on exactly what it was. I do remember that all the stomach problems I'd been having, they settled first and that gave me a bit more confidence. So that's been brilliant to have that return. I'm more able, obviously. I do work from home and although I 
now full time, I do have some flexibility in the hours as to when I work. Compared to where I was, I mean, this is it's phenomenal where I am now. But I do every day wonder how long this is going to be. You know, next year, am I going to be having a relapse? Um, and I think most of us carry that around. So I try and take care. I've never been very good at pacing, even though I try and get other people to do it. I still am the world's worst, but I do my best. So having Buster, my Labrador, who's now 17 months old, has helped because Buster helps balance all the energy that I put into work with doing some good things. I think if I didn't have Buster, I'd be far too much work focused, but with Buster, you know, he's, he's a living thing that needs to be taken care of. To be honest, he doesn't care if we don't go out for a walk on a particular day, if, I, if I'm not feeling well or something like that. That's a very kind dog. <laughs> he's grown up with me, but he obviously does love his walks and he is a big dog. Very lucky, we've just moved to viewed in Cornwall. Every other day we try and get out to the beach or to the reservoir, give him a good run. Never been in a marriage, I've never had children. So for me, Buster's my my family, I suppose, which might sound a bit sad, but honestly, it's bit, I spent so long on my own with Emmy. He's been a godsend. For me, it's very telling that when you say, oh, he knows when I'm feeling really bad and I can't go out to do his favorite things. Like, whoa, that's, a, that's amazing. But that's the power in the fact that, you know, um, you find that very useful as well. It, it's bringing meaning and it's being of positive impact within your life. What's your day like? How does your day start and how does it end? I can't sleep for longer than four hours at a time. So what I tend to do is, if I've had a reasonably good night, I will start work at four o'clock in the morning or maybe earlier. Because for me, if I've had a disturbed night and I've had some bad nightmares or night sweats or whatever the reason is that I've had a disturbed night, it's better for me to get up and get my head into something than it is to try and wrestle with the reasons why I'm having a disturbed night or, you know, to try and get back to sleep because that never it never works for me. So I'd rather get up, get started, get into something. And so I start my day quite early. My employer, the charity, they seem quite happy with me to, to do that. So then I'll work for a few hours before taking a break, usually to take bust around the estate. And then I'll come back and carry on with work until about lunchtime. I'm working full time now, as I said. And then in the afternoons, when I finished work, if I'm up to it, take Buster to the beach or something. And then when we come back, we'll have something to eat and we usually go to bed. Or if we don't go for a walk, we go to bed as soon as I finished work. And then that's it, really. The rest of the day is resting. Anything you want anybody to take away from today's conversation? I always thought I was mentally strong, physically strong. I don't think anything prepares you for something like ME or long COVID. I have to say to my younger self to value each day as it comes. If I could go back in time, it would be to enjoy every day that you, you get. You are not alone. I think it is a very isolating condition. I think it's important to realize that you aren't alone. It isn't necessary that you have to be isolated with this condition. There's help out there. Wow, what a story. Thank you for sharing with us, Russell. I find it humbling given the daily challenge one has to face, especially with pacing yourself, just so you can function on your baseline each day. As we have learned from today's episode, living with ME is a journey and every day is different. If you want to read more about his story, Surviving ME CFS by Russell Fleming, you can find more details around this podcast show notes. Thank you for listening and hope you join us again on our next episode.